We have a hand raised from Jahana Zaib Ali from ARY News Pakistan. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. Uh, sir, my question is that that uh, most of the politicians and world leaders criticize Caleb for inaccurate uh, reporting or whatever they say. And uh, we have seen like in 2016 presidential elections, even in 2012, President Obama criticized Caleb for inaccurate results. So what are the challenges and difficulties uh, to make a good math and uh, to get the like good results of the pollsters or whatever it is. Thank you. Great question. Um, There's actually a very different exercise than the data we're looking at now. So what you're referring to is forecasting outcomes of elections. And to forecast the outcome of an election, it really relies on uh, two things. Number one, your response rate in your survey. And number two, the model that you build for the likely voter in that election. So election forecasts, which is what our founder became famous for um, in the 30s and, and on, really comes down to those two uh, variables that are very difficult to nail. Two things have happened. So though that's very different than taking a national uh, poll of, of people's perceptions. Actually, one of, and we check the validity of those metrics in every poll we do, um, and they've been remarkably accurate, uh, really remarkably accurate when you look at vaccination rates, when you look at um, economic metrics and people's confidence, it really tracks a lot of things. Um, so there's no debate that uh, RDD, which is uh, the phone-based approach, isn't accurate. The challenge now in U.S. election forecasting is response rates, those two variables, response rates have shrunk down very low. We have the highest response rates in the U.S. They're at 8%. Response rates used to be like, you know, over 50%. So the people that are answering the phone um, are far less, and it's harder to get a broader slice of the population. There's other ways to, to, to get, get uh, to randomize your sample. But the real factor that's changed is the uh, likely voter model because voting behaviors have changed in the United States. We actually stopped forecasting elections um, in the final, uh, our final election was between Obama and Romney, if you all remember that. Um, and we made a decision at that point as an institution that we weren't bringing a lot of value, focusing so much of our resources on forecasting an election because a lot of other organizations had been doing it as well. Um, and I'm really happy you asked this question, Ali, because there's a lot of confusion about Gallup and our involvement in this. Um, George Gallup actually found very little value in forecasting elections. If you read his speeches, as I have, he repeatedly would say that there's not a lot of value in projecting what everybody's going to know tomorrow. But the reason he chose presidential elections was because of a methodological reason, because it has a dichotomous outcome. And it was something that was already garnering the public's focus here in the United States. So his mission wasn't really to project uh, the outcome of an election. His mission was to prove that sampling methods could be a reliable source of what the public thinks. His, his, um, their, his epigraph, his very famous quote that kind of captures his whole life's mission, was if democracy is the will of the people, somebody should go and find what that will is. And that was really his passion and it continues to be our passion today. Um, even more so, the will of the people in the United States is less and less, unfortunately, been determined by what happens in an election. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, public opinion data to suggest and prove that people are feeling very um, disenfranchised from the process. The pandemic changed that a lot uh, because people were able to vote in ways they weren't able to vote before. And that's why we saw a record high of participation um, in the election itself. So again, for those organizations that are still forecasting elections, the last election was probably one of the most difficult to do because that likely voter model, there were so many question marks about who was gonna turn out to vote um, that then what would usually happen in a traditional setting. Can I ask one more question, please? Sure. Um, sir, so this is a different world we are living right now. You know, there's a different crowd on social media and different crowd when you call people at the house. And 
people are not using landlines now, and less people who are using a landline. So how how every single survey is legitimate? I mean, because there are different crowds in the social media. I mean, if you go for the Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram, so I mean, how how you make it legitimate? Yeah, that this is gonna happen, and this is a real survey. Because I I have an example in Pakistan. Like I have seen your Gallup survey about the Prime Minister Imran Khan. It was so good, but in reality, there's a different story. So okay, I'm I actually just that. Ali, let me stop you there. First of all, um, just to be clear, since we are on the record, I have to say Gallup Pakistan is actually not Gallup, um, and there's litigation dealing with that issue. We don't ask about Imran Khan. Um, we ask about the leadership of Pakistan. That being said, that being said, um, you make a really good point in um, methodology and the landline issue is, has, is not new. It's, it's been developing now for over 30 years and it's why actually our polls are predominantly based on cell phone, not landline. So we're at this point, we're 70% cell phone, 30% landline. That ratio has been shifting towards cell phone for every major uh, public opinion survey research organization here in the United States. And it's based essentially on national behavior. So a lot of the metrics that we use to make sure that our samples are representative, a lot of it comes from census data and other external data um, of sort of the lay of the land. Are people using cell phones? What percentage of people are using cell phones? Um, I was actually just in a meeting last month where we're thinking about when we need to bump up that cell phone representation based on the fact that more and more people now are not having landlines. So those challenges are very real. Every article that we publish has a survey methods section at the bottom where we explain exactly how we um, gathered the sample. Uh, but the RDD methodology here in the US is uh, pretty well known. Uh, other organizations uh, like NRC and, and others uh, pursue a very similar methodology. We're all members of uh, APOR, the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers, and that's really um, a self-guided uh, and regulated professional association that sets the standards for what is a legitimately representative poll versus not representative. You mentioned Twitter um, and social media. A major challenge in our field is um, to try to really understand what people think in a country. It's very easy to hear the loudest voices and the loudest of the loudest voices always tend to pop up on social media. So taking a poll of social media users is very useful to understand what perhaps those people on that platform think, but to project their ex uh, experiences, attitudes, et cetera, to the general public is very uh, inadvisable because they tend to be a certain kind of a person. Um, and it's essentially an opt-in self-selection kind of a situation. So you raised really great points, um, and I encourage all of you as reporters, honestly, there's a lot of really bad data out there, um, more than ever before. Please always ask for uh, an organization to send you their methods, uh, methodology information, and if they don't publish it already on what they're creating, it's probably not really well done work from my personal experience.